Hi everybody, John Jagerson here. Traders are dealing with a little bit of a, a disappointment since last week. Everything looked really rosy. We had some uh, positive guidance from the Fed. Here I'm talking relative to the pace at which they are likely to continue raising interest rates. Everybody got really excited, probably got a little bit ahead of ourselves, but let's just talk about where we're at on the S&P right now. So as I look at the, at the chart right now, we've got a, a little bit of a retracement. As we said last week, this is a long-term trend line resistance. So from a technical perspective, traders are gonna just naturally have a bias towards emphasizing the bad news in the market, which these days, that means good news. So here's what I mean. Now this is a phenomenon we've seen already and we're gonna to continue to experience it into 2023, which is, when the market gets good economic news, we're probably going to see a increased risk of a negative reaction to that good news in the market because it means that the Fed is therefore likely to raise rates faster, further, longer, et cetera, et cetera. So this back and forth, if you think this is, uh, is indecision in the market, that's exactly what it is. And it comes into play when we're stuck in channels. So it becomes particularly pronounced at, at times like this. So. Is this a problem? Well, I, I would say no. So, so what was the good news is bad news situation? Well, today we had the ISM report uh, from, it's, well, the Institute for Supply Management, they issue a report, um, there's two versions of it that I really like, the Purchasing Managers Index. One is for manufacturers and the other one is for services businesses. So today the services number came out. So uh, services are everything from, of course, restaurants, things like that, so consumer services. And what they're basically asking is, uh, they're asking purchasing managers at these, at these businesses, uh, what do you think about the future demand? What do you think about pricing? What do you think about hiring? What do you think about wage pressures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They take all this information and then they, they issue a, what we call a diffusion index, which is basically that if you're above 50, then uh, we're in expansion territory. And if you're uh, below 50, then we're in contraction territory. So today the numbers came in at 56.5, which is actually pretty good. So 56.5, it does get higher than this. Now it's roughly in line with where we've been. We've had a couple of dips, but we've been basically here for a few months. So, so this isn't a dramatic increase, but it is above what we had expected to get, which was at about 53.5. This is based on a, a average survey of analysts out there by like Bloomberg, Reuters does a similar one. And, and they, they were all basically in that, in that range. So the bottom line is, purchasing managers at services businesses are saying that they are, are essentially still operating in an economic expansion environment. Recession or not, that's, that's the way that they are behaving as if we are not in a recession, that they are expanding. So that's a positive. And on top of that, we had factory orders that on a month over month basis were way above expectations. That one can be a little bit more erratic, but it, it was also good news. So investors see this as basically an excuse to take some profits off the table. And you can see that here on the S&P. So let me just clean this up a little bit and we'll zoom in just a tad. So <clears throat> I started out last week saying that I think right now the market's probably in a good buy the dips mode. And I stand by that. I, I think that the reaction today, if it is a reaction to good news, meaning bad news, then I stand by it. There's a pattern we've seen over and over and over again that as long as the good news is relatively consistent and reliable, then we're probably still in that situation where we look at uh, buying opportunities on, on the dips. Now, from one perspective, we could say, well, what's how deep is the dip likely to be? So maybe from a technical perspective, we've got a little bit of short-term trend line support at around 39.60. That, that is a, well, even above that, maybe 39.70, something in that range. I think that's a possibility. If we saw the market pause there, that looks that looks pretty interesting for as an accumulation area to increase uh, portfolio exposure to the market. Uh, I suspect we'll probably come back to around uh, horizontal resistance, which is in fact at around 39, or horizontal support, which is at around 39.60. So that, that seems to be the more likely scenario. Now I've had some questions as to, well, what kinds of stocks should I be buying? Is this any environment for consumer defensive utilities and healthcare, which tend to be the really defensive categories that investors try to favor when, they, when the economic outlook is more uncertain? 
which makes logical sense. There are a couple of problems with that, however. So we have to be careful. We don't throw it all the way out, but we do have to be careful with that. So uh, let me bring up another chart here. So this is the TNX, which we're gonna check in on again, as usual, and we're gonna visit this a couple of times today. Uh, so the TNX was up a little bit today as investors were pricing in. Economic growth means higher interest rates. That is usually the case. That is why actually interest rates and stock prices, they usually trend together. So they usually go up at the same time. Now over the last decade, everything has been just skiwampus. But, but generally speaking, that is the way that it goes. Uh, the, this quarter has been the opposite. But so uh, interest rates are up a little bit. So the, this is the 10 year yield, which is a good proxy, which right now it you know, closed at exactly 3.6%. So it's a good proxy for the cost of capital in general. Uh, it's a lot higher obviously than it was during the pandemic recession. Uh, and it, it is a constraint on growth. And it's one of the things that when the Fed raises interest rates, which they're going to do again next week, when they raise interest rates, what they're actually doing is they're raising the overnight rate. But when the overnight rate goes up, then it kind of trickles through the rest of the yield curve. And we would expect that longer term yields would, in fact, rise. But it's not a one for one relationship. So it, it, whatever the Fed does, it's not going to be necessarily proportional on the longer term uh, end of the yield curve. And the longer term end of the yield curve can go up and down kind of independent of what the, the Fed is doing based on what investors think about growth and what they think about inflation. So should we be alarmed? Probably not. This uh, is a moderately sized move. It does not look like a panic. We didn't see any other risk indicators really accelerating all that much. Uh, I'll give you a few examples here. So the VIX, the market fear index, it's a measure of how much uh, volatility investors are pricing into the S&P 500 over the next 30 days. Uh, classically, we think about volatility as equal to risk. So, and as you can see here, we're looking at the VIX, uh, it's still in decline, it popped up a little bit today, but. Not too bad, it is elevated. So there is kind of this general vibe of risk out there in the market. But uh, compared to where we were in October, this is uh, looking pretty good. Another risk indicator that I pay a lot of attention to is high yield bonds, which also sold off a little bit today with stocks. The high yield bonds, now this is actually an ETF that tracks high yield bonds, I like it. It's not a perfect measure of whether high yield bonds are rising or falling. The symbol is HYG, it's the iShares version. There's a Spiders version as well. High yield bonds, or what used to be called junk bonds, are a good measure of risk appetite because bond investors can be, in my experience anyway, a bit more rational than stock investors in general about risk. So if they start selling off dramatically, then we would wanna pay very close attention to that, especially if they were selling off and stocks were not. Now we, we haven't had a signal like that for a while, but it, it does pop up regularly enough a few times a year that it's worth monitoring. So it's down a little bit today, but nothing here looks like a panic at all. I'd be looking for if high yield bonds were, and I'll use, I'll use HYG as my proxy here. So if high yield bonds were to dip, let's say down to 74, so that would break support at 74.50, I'd get a little bit more cautious. At that point, I might hold off on accumulating any more, even if there looks like some good deals out there. So let me return to that question. Should investors be buying uh, defensive stocks like utilities, consumer staples, and healthcare? Well, in, in the latter two examples, probably, that, that, that does look to, and I've been recommending that for a while, uh, and I've got some examples, but we should be pretty choosy. In the first, uh, utilities, that's a tricky one because utilities are priced a lot like bonds are uh, because they are largely valued off their, their income. So let, let me bring up XLU. This is a spider share fund. It's an ETF that tracks uh, utilities. Let me back up just a little bit. Now, if utilities are largely valued like a bond, meaning that they're valued off their income, which in this case is dividends, well, that, that means that rising rates is uh, puts pressure on utilities. Also, utilities, it's harder for them to raise prices when inflation is rising because they're regulated, or most of them are. So it, the, this sector, and I've said this quite a bit this year, this sector is gonna be prone to very shocking drops, especially for such a conservative group. And you can even just visualize this on my chart here. I'm looking back over the last basic nine months here. And you can see that when XLU, the ETF that tracks all these utilities, when it sells off, it sells off fast. This could be for very risk tolerant investors. This might even be a fishing hole for some short positions in the market if you want some strategic diversification because it is probably overvalued and I would not put it on my, even though the gains here recently have been pretty good, I would not put this on my accumulation list because 
everything that is wrong in the economy right now it is multiplied. It's really uh, a huge issue for utility stocks. However, when you think about consumer staples and healthcare, there there's some interesting opportunities. Now, I don't want to rehash some of those that I've been talking about. I think a lot of discount retailers are at a very good deal. Well, I can't resist. So I'll say like Dollar General, this is the one I talked about last week, which after their earnings report, they uh, dropped back to support. And I said at the time, this is probably still a good deal. Uh, looks discounted. I, I think they're, they'll at least fill their gap in there in the short term. So th this would be kind of a classic example. I know some of them have been selling off today, which may present some nice value opportunities. But even beyond that, I would think about the kinds of uh, consumer staples or consumer uh, uh, defensive so those companies that they continue to uh, take advantage of their customer base, even when there's market shakeups, I think there's still some opportunities there. I would use Starbucks as a classic example. I think that they are a bit extended right now, but still look good. Uh, Constellation Brands is another favorite of mine. If you don't know who they are, let me bring that chart up again. Okay, so Constellation Brands, if you don't know who they are, that's uh, like Corona Beer. They are at resistance, I think, on the dips. That looks very interesting. They're uh, very, a dominant player in the seltzer business uh, for adult beverages. Um, they it imported beer business. The margins are good. They have uh, solid pricing power. It, it, they have a lot of power over their suppliers. So they, the, these are the kinds of companies, so Starbucks, Constellation, where we'd be targeting them as far as consumer staples. In healthcare, I'd be a lot more interested in those that are a bit more of a hybrid. So take, for example, Procter & Gamble, where it is in the healthcare business, it is bumping up against resistance. So this is another one where I might look for a pullback before buying in, looking for those opportunities on the dips. But uh, a, those that are kind of bridging the gap between a consumer stock and a healthcare stock, that's where valuations are actually pretty good. Now, now these are still largely valued off their dividend, but not like utilities. So are there opportunities? I think that there are, but I'd be pretty choosy about it and not just default to what we might have done in prior economic cycles that uh, that were similar to this, because this is we're in a unique situation where it does appear that we're, economically speaking, in a recession, and yet those key uh, portions of the economy that we would think should be going down are not. They're in fact going up. Labor, consumer spending, as you saw with the purchasing managers index today, spending at the institutional level it, it is still rising or at least positive. All right, so with that, let's get to your questions. All right, let's see here. Uh, normally the US dollar strengthens against major currencies. So this is a question on Friday. Usually the US dollar strengthens on uh, against major currencies when the market drops, but not today on the the 5th of December. Okay, no, this is a question from today. Okay, I apologize. All right, from the 5th of December, what does this mean? So the US dollar, let's bring up the dollar index. Uh, and I'll give you the short answer here is not much, but but you're, you're right. Um, it uh, it usually does strengthen when the market drops, or at least that's been the relationship here recently. But that is not always, that's not the normal relationship, actually. So think about it like this. L let's say that we could go back in time, we could look at the dollar during quantitative easing campaigns. So many times when the Fed is going to be loosening monetary policy, that means interest rates are going to go down. The dollar is therefore less attractive, all else being equal. Uh, but stocks would go up. So stocks would go up, dollar would go down. Uh, the which you know we might expect that that's uh, that that would be the the case. But then other times we'll get the dollar uh, falling and uh, stocks falling as well because U.S. assets are less attractive. So today, right now, what we're seeing is that interest rate expectations are rising. So the dollar is rising, which you can see here, the dollar on a on a weighted basis. Is uh, is rising and the and the market is falling because everybody's afraid of the impact that's going to have on stocks and which the other side of that coin is it has a positive impact on the value of the dollar. So I would not um, I would probably not look at that as a long term correlation. It, it it's more erratic than that. But you know I I think to your point, however. Here right now, if we did see a divergence, you know, barring anything fundamentally changing, we, we might want to look at that as a barometer. I mean, today, however, it's uh, normal. So uh, the U.S. dollar strengthened and uh, the market dropped. So, all right, let's see here. Uh, 
Friday's close remain near the highs of Wednesday's post pal speech from Kevin and good news on jobs, which today, good news is bad news, I guess, that's true. Uh, do you think the bullishness can last? Or do you think this is just euphoria on a slightly less hawkish Fed? Does the Fed require unemployment to crater before they slow or pivot? Uh, well, I will tell you what the Fed does not say in their announcements, but what they have said, uh, Fed members have said many, many, many times, is that if you want to fight inflation, you have to drive unemployment higher. Now, they're not saying that in their announcements, but they all have said that outside of their announcements. Uh, so it, it's pretty safe for us to assume that that, 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 that is something that they believe. Uh, is it going to be true this time? Do they have to do it? Uh, no, I mean, what the Fed says, what individual Fed governors say, and what they actually do are usually two very different things. So I, I probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't worry about it um, uh, too much. But, uh, but to, more to your point, it, it, should we look at uh, today's retrace, this week's retracement? So Friday was a little weak. Um, uh, today was a bit of a decline. Should we look at this as a, as a problem with the market? I don't think so. I think we still got support, you know, in the 3920 to 3950 range. I, I'd be a buyer at those levels, especially momentum looked like it was beginning to pause. Uh, any kind of, uh, if it took, a, if it continued to decline and we didn't see any you know, real bullishness until we're getting to next week's uh, announcement from the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, I'm, I might wait until after that announcement for adding a lot, but it does risk maybe missing an opportunity like last week again. Uh, however, in this case, I, I think it'd probably be worth it. But uh, bottom line is the, the I would not set your expectations that, that the market is gonna be any less volatile than it has been. So as you're making plans, I would, a one day retracement, don't read too much into it. We're going to get lots of volatility. And I don't see any reason why that's going to end through the first quarter of next year. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is it possible that we already had our recession in the first half of 2022 with two quarters of negative GDP? Uh, well, I think we'll probably get another quarter. So we, we, sh we should get another quarter. I'd be very surprised if we didn't. At least maybe another two quarters of negative GDP. Uh, alternatively, could we be in a rolling recession depending on the industry? Y yeah, that, that's that's likely. And it, a lot of this gets into semantics about what's a recession, what's not a recession. But if we're just talking about is economic growth likely to be positive this quarter, I think probably not. Um, is the uh, and part of the reason why I say that is that corporate earnings outside of the energy market are going to be negative. So, and we can say that with a very high level of confidence. So if you exclude energy, we're gonna get another negative, and probably even including energy, we'll probably get a negative a quarter when the fourth quarter earnings reports come out in January. So, you know, we're in kind of a recession right now. I think it's uh, ongoing, uh, but um, it is it is possible we might, uh, we might see a, a softer landing than a full-on recession like what we've experienced in 2008 or the near miss in 2015 or certainly uh, 2020. All right, let's see here. Uh, maybe obvious question from Winterman, but does technical analysis influence the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 because they are based on stocks? Yes. So they should be influenced only by a change of stock prices. Am I missing something? No, the, it, it is. I mean, technical analysis is a is an analysis of price change over time, uh, and yes, we would apply technical analysis to the Nasdaq and the S&P. And when you uh, uh, and what changes of price over time is is a reflection of the underlying fundamentals. So fun, as fundamentals change, so it really is kind of a combination of those things. But uh, they, so are they influenced by fundamentals? Yes, they are influenced by economic fundamentals. That's why the market uh, bounced like it did last week, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, generally, so earnings trends, for example, or key, me key members of those indexes can have an outsized influence. So as an example, I'll, I'll bring up the, uh, well, I'll just go for one that's easy, if that's okay. I, the, the QQQ is the ETF that tracks the NASDAQ. Uh, and it is, wildly overweight to Apple and Microsoft. So as, as Apple and Microsoft go, that's how the cubes are gonna go. It, even though it's diversified-ish, uh, with representative of a lot of different stocks, it is so overweight to those two stocks that if they are having a bad day or a good day, 
Even if the rest of the market is doing something completely the opposite, which does happen, uh, then the cubes will follow uh, Microsoft and NASDAQ. It'll just be a little bit more muted. So that there, we, you, you listed the example of the NASDAQ and the S&P, and that, and that is true to a great extent with the S&P as well. Microsoft, NASDAQ, Alphabet, Tesla, the, they're gonna have a, a huge outsized impact on it. So if they, so there's not a totally neutral index. And now there are some that are like that. One that, this is also another ETF, so if you'll bear with me for a second. Uh, the, the ETF that I oftentimes use is a good example of this, the RSP which is an index of the S&P 500, but it's on an equal weight index. So they're all 0.2% of the uh, index. The, regardless of how big they are, that's what, or roughly, that's what they are. So if you're ever feeling like maybe one of them is pushing around the index, you want to get something that's more pure, diversified reflection of what's going on in the market, RSP is a, is a good one to watch. Well, thanks, Brandon, for the comment there. Um, All right, I think I got the questions. So I will pause here. Of course, we'll be back again uh, later this week once we have a little bit of extra economic data. What I'd be looking forward to, however, is probably not anything over the next couple of days. I think the tentacles are gonna be the major player right now. What's likely to be the big news event this week is coming out on Friday when we get the PPI, the Producer Price Index, which is the last inflation report that we'll get before the Fed meets next week. So that's probably the big market mover. Between now and then, I would anticipate a market that's a little erratic. The buying on the dips makes some sense, and we'll be back at the end of the week to talk about it. In the meantime, if you like the kind of content that we're producing, you want to help us to grow the channel, please let us know by giving us a thumbs up, subscribing to the channel, telling your friends. And if you have questions, please leave them as comments to this video or any of the others. We read them all. They're very helpful. Suggestions for future topics, etc. All right, thanks everybody.